in the 1920s when power stations were dotted around main conurbations and uh, were not interconnected with each other. And during the First World War and uh, immediately afterwards people felt there was a lot of ways they could run the plant if they were connected together. So that in 1936 we had the first grid system in the world interconnected, fully interconnected across the UK. Capable of doing that, at that time it was operated in seven areas. So that you had seven areas which then uh, eventually were joined together and uh, in 1938 they started to operate as one grid system and therefore you had controllers like this. The story is that somebody on night shift decided that wouldn't it be nice if we connected it together? So they did it during the night. It worked. Uh, in the uh, later period in 38, 1938, they put, uh, put it all together and ran it as an interconnected system. So people wanted more electricity. But of course the war intervened and uh, all plans had to be shelved during the war when the interconnected system again showed its worth because when bombing took place in London and power stations in London were bombed, then you were able to bring supplies in from outside the conurbations. People wanted electric kettles, they wanted electric washing machines and television was just beginning to start to come into the system and things like that. But it was quickly realised that the way the demand for electricity was growing, that you wouldn't be able to develop the existing plant to cope with it, and we needed larger generators to be connected to the system. Secondly, uh, the growth of demand in the south was growing far faster than we could get generating new generating plant in the south. So we'd got to bring in uh, coal by wire is, is the expression that was used. And so that um, we ended up with a, um, a 275 kV network being proposed called the Supergrid. So you have the earlier stuff from the 1930s, the 132 network, which was the original grid. See the size of the person there. They can still transfer quite a lot of power, 160 megawatts, which uh, is quite considerable. And then in the late 50s, early 60s, they moved up to 275 kV. So that's a, about 1,000 megawatts, so a substantial difference. Late 60s, early 70s, another up, step up to 400,000 volts and uh, a massive increase to now about 3,000 megawatts transfer. My background was really in power stations. I was the power, st a power station manager at one time and then responsible for managing a group of power stations. And it was suggested to me that I, I was made an offer to become the system operation engineer for the Central Electricity Generating Board. Well, National Control Centre in the 1970s was at a Bankside uh, location, <coughs> close to where Bankside Power Station is now. In the national control room, there were three desks and a big diagram on the wall, very similar to that which is in the present national control centre, where the, uh, all the network was shown diagrammatically and where the uh, switch positions were shown by red or green lights, whether the switches were closed or not. So glancing at the diagram on the wall enable you to understand the configuration and the availability of system of, uh, net, of uh, circuits on the network. Well, I think controlling the system now is far more complex than it was for us. We faced emergencies that they don't, and are very unlikely to face. But on the other hand, their normal operation is far more complex than ours. We didn't have a market to operate, although in a sense the order of merit was a market, but it was a very much simpler market than they have to deal with now. We didn't have wind generation. We didn't have to estimate what the power, what the uh, wind speed would be, and how much generation would occur. We didn't have uh, uh, 
any solar power and we didn't need to estimate how much it would come from the lights, uh, uh, the, uh, the sunlight on, uh, on solar generation. So life now is far more complicated for them than it was for us. But I think we faced emergencies of, which were very severe and which were very different to any of the body, those which anybody here now would uh, experience. We uh, had problems, of course, because in those days, in the days of nationalised industries, trade unions had tremendous power and we could have national strikes very readily if, uh, with a pay dispute. In addition to which, trade unions were very m much more effective in calling out members and, and causing national emergencies in industries that were not nationalised. And I think in those days we faced strikes or threatened strikes from railway workers, from tanker drivers, from uh, the National Coal Board's employees, from water workers, from seamen. What had only just come into the job when the 1971 miners' strike uh, came. And <coughs> uh, we had to apply voltage reductions. And I remember uh, the chairman at one time telling me that we couldn't continue with these voltage reductions because no longer were they able to cook steaks effectively in the stock exchange canteen. The, the government were very slow to understand the problems that we had and how serious they could be. And they were uh, very re uh, reluctant to uh, apply uh, the uh, emergency powers. And it wasn't until later that they realized that there was a, a very serious problem. And we were nine days from the system having actually closing down, which would have been a disastrous event before the problem was solved. In 1973-4, uh, they were understood the problem rather better and they managed the affairs rather better than they'd done, they'd done earlier. Of course, in 1973-74, first of all, we had uh, a curtailment of oil supplies to the West by OPEC because of there being a, an Israeli-Arab war taking place. We had a, a, a work to rule, an overtime ban by the uh, railway workers. We had our own engineering staff had an overtime ban and that was a time when uh, where coal stocks were not as high as they might have been and the government realised this was a problem. And I remember that uh, a, 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 a uh, emergency was declared fairly early and uh, uh, a three-day week was implied. Uh, of course, the government uh, uh, decided uh, to uh, go to the country for a general election on the, when the NUM, which had had an overtime ban going on for three or four months, decided to actually go on strike. And of course, then that Ted Heath uh, decided he would have a general election, which he lost. And of course, the, co the miners then believed that they'd toppled the Conservative government, which was then uh, some degree of motivator for what might have what, what later happened with Cargill in the 1980s. I felt that electric supply was in a sense the Achilles heel of society, that if anybody wanted to bend the government to their will, then they did it by coming to electric supply. Because I think everybody realised that without electricity, life as we know it really doesn't, can't carry on. This control room is very, very different to the control room that I first worked in in 1987. Actually, it's a different place. Uh, we used to have uh, five area control rooms around the country, and that was all brought together to bring a unified control in, in, in this room. And that was done uh, in the late 1990s. So it's a different room, but of course, it's very different from a technology point of view. Uh, in this room you've got uh, modern technology with, with touch screens, an animated map board that all of the circuits can have the, their colours change so that control engineers can tell whether they're switched in or whether they're switched out and, and how substations are connected together. Back in 1987 we did have a big map board on the wall. The map board was um, even more important actually than the map board is today because it wasn't supported by banks and banks of, uh, of computer screens actually in front of the control en engineer showing the detail. So the control engineers used to work off the map board 
to a much greater degree. But the MacBook didn't do as much. It um, it had some lights that would that would light up, just bulbs. Um, if particular things happened, if a circuit was switched in or switched out as a substation, a little light would come on. But the map board was built by putting ceramic tiles on the wall. And there was actually, in our organization back then, there was a, uh, a team in the back office who were responsible for getting all the new tiles as the, as the system evolved and new lines were put on the system. They would come in with a box of tiles and they would get a ladder and go up onto the wall and put in, take out a load of tiles and put in a load of new tiles. Uh, with Park Street, you used to, the, the whole room was um, far less crowded with desks. Uh, you could tell they were designed by the CGB. They were all painted in battleship gray. Massive, great old desks with uh, Ferranti computers in them. And um, I can, another thing I could distinctly remember then, of course, smoking was almost mandatory. So there were ashtrays and fag ash everywhere. And when you came in to take over, from previous shift, you would be wiping away all of the sm all of the cigarette ash from the log sheets, and of course that was another thing. It was all paper log sheets, paper records, which one you'd pull out and look at to compare how one did the job. Whereas now, it's on a lot of computer screens. Uh, back in those days, the control engineer would have a special dedicated line to each uh, power station. He'd pick up a handset and he'd just click a little switch uh, on a on a board down by his knee, which would say uh, West Thurrock, and you would just click that switch and it would ring at West Thurrock, and it would ring a special phone at West Thurrock control room. And, uh, and, and the power stations knew that when that phone rang, that was the grid control engineer telling them what they had to do, increase load, decrease load, and that was an important thing. In fact, there used to be stories of uh, power station engineers sort of almost saluting when the when the phone from grid control rang I would say you know some decades before I worked in the industry but you know a real degree of authority that came from the management of the system by the grid control engineers when I joined the CGB in 1983 this was if you like a, a sort of technocratic organization and I mean no disrespect by that at all it was a, an organization which um, put engineering right at the top of its list of priorities. A lot of proud engineers, a lot of very bright engineers who uh, were hell-bent on designing and operating the most high-tech and efficient electricity system they could and were very interested in the engineering aspects. And there were a lot of very good things about that. The sense of pride was something that I still, I think, carry with me today, so it's pride in our responsibility to society. The organisation then, around 1990, went into a different phase, and that's of course because of privatisation. So the organisation, I think, held on to a lot of those senses of pride, of engineering excellence. But what we had added was a sense of commercial realities the need to be more responsive to the source of capital that were going to come into this newly privatised industry. Um, perhaps more of an emphasis on managing in shorter timescales. Before that, we were really minimum cost of an organisation. Uh, money came from the government, um, although it didn't, that's what they perceived. So we got to move that culture to one of saying, well, look, it's our share price, it's our, our um, actual profits, and we've got to make profits, we've got to devise profits, we've got to make the systems and make those profits. And so the, that was a culture change. We, we have, of course, been in a period of constant change there's a temptation at every point to say, well, there's huge change ahead. There's always huge change ahead. Energy systems are complex, changing things. The economics of, just think about how the economics of oil, coal, gas has changed right across this period. How nuclear has been in fashion, gone out of fashion, it's come back into fashion. So we're always changing, but, but I think it is fair to say that, that uh, there do seem to be very large changes ahead once again. 
our approach to uh, energy and electricity in particular has been focused on some some particular characteristics. Um, a national approach where you had a big transmission system and that was sort of the heart of the system. Big power stations burning big chun chunks of fossil fuel and uh, big nuclear power stations. So, so generate large amounts of power well away from communities and ship it in through big circuits. That served us very well and we've been through massive changes even in that, in, in, in that sort of environment. But it's all changing. The national picture will continue to be important but is joined, if you like, on either side by two new things. A much more interconnected world of electricity, interconnected to other countries. Energy is becoming even more a global issue. And you can see that actually from the way that our national grid system is connected to the rest of Europe. The other end of it is even more interesting. As well as national, we're now going to local. Why is local becoming so important in our electricity system? Because people are generating power on their own homes because of the advent of very significant amounts of photovoltaic uh, on people's roofs, which together are generating very large amounts of power. So we're no longer in a situation where you generate power in big chunks and ship it down through a system to customers and to businesses. We've actually got a blend of big and small. And people are now talking about balancing local systems with new perhaps heat networks, perhaps hydrogen networks. You've got the prospect of a lot of uh, electric cars being charged at home. You've got the prospect of people deploying heat pumps instead of gas-fired central heating boilers, which in themselves will use a lot of electricity to drive the heat pump. So we're seeing a picture now where the system is much more complicated and, and where the local context is becoming really important, the international context is becoming really important to sit next to the national context. If, we were, if we'd been stood here 10, 12 years ago and we'd been talking about perhaps 10 gigawatts of wind power being connected to the system, you know, there would have been commentators outside of this room who were saying, how will you control the system with 10 gigawatts of wind power? What happens when the wind isn't blowing? There were many commentators saying that, but here we are. Those 10 years on, we've got uh, potentially a fifth of our power at some points being met by wind power. And we control the system just fine. The lights are staying on and the system is under control. So it shows how we are able to evolve our facilities, to evolve our commercial approach to make sure that we keep the system secure.